This is Peter Rose, editor of Australian Book Review. Each year, ABR publishes an issue devoted to questions of sustainability, climate change and the environment. This annual themed issue is supported by the Bian K. Dahl Trust in Melbourne. The highlight of this annual environment issue is the ABR Dahl Trust Fellowship. The Dahl Trust Fellow receives $7,500 from ABR to write a long essay on some aspect of the eucalypt. The 2015 Dahl Fellow was Ashley Hay and her essay is titled The Forest at the Edge of Time. Ashley Hay is well known to Australian readers. She has published novels and four works of non-fiction. Some years ago she published a book called Gum and in The Forest at the Edge of Time she revisits that influential work. Hay's most recent novel is The Railwayman's Wife, which won the 2013 Colin Roderick Prize. In 2014, she edited The Best Australian Science Writing, which will give you an indication of the breadth of her talents and interests. Now it gives me much pleasure to introduce Ashley Hay, who will speak about and then read from her essay, The Forest, at the edge of time. Here is Ashley Hay. This essay, The Forest at the Edge of Time, was written thanks to a fellowship provided by the Dahl Trust in honour of Bjarn Dahl, a Norwegian forester who moved to Australia and forged a lifelong attachment to and passion for this country's iconic trees, the eucalypts. It was published in the annual environment issue of the Australian Book Review, to whom I'm also very grateful. More than 13 years ago, I wrote a book called Gum, the story of eucalypts and their champions, during which time I learned to pay a particular and intimate kind of attention to these extraordinary trees and their stories. This essay was the first time I'd written specifically about these trees since then, and it was lovely to be back amongst their stories. I ended Gum with an image of eucalypts as adaptable, diverse, tenacious, interactive, opportunistic. When I finished writing, late in 2001, Two crucial scientific topics were less prominent in the public mind than they are today, climate change and genetics and DNA sequencing. Consequently, neither of those things appeared in that book. Then, not long after its publication, I saw coverage of some experiments designed to investigate what might happen to certain plants under increased carbon dioxide levels and decreased levels of water. My memory is that those eucalypts were thriving. It piqued my interest and it lodged somewhere deep in my imagination. At the same time, thanks to sequencing and data mining, researchers were beginning to examine these trees' history in very different ways and investigating a range of extraordinary possible future applications they may offer, including new medicines, new timbers and even jet fuels. In this way, more extraordinary new windows were being opened onto the trees' deep past and their various possible futures. Here then, it seemed to me, was a chance to talk about eucalypts in terms of adaptation on the one hand and potential on the other, in the micro terms of the realities of genomics and in the macro terms not only of the trees in their natural landscapes, but as one of the myriad intersecting and interreacting players in the planet's ongoing adaptation to changing climate. In trying to think around this, I also wanted to celebrate the work of a host of different scientists and to write something that looked not at the political and public faces of climate change, which can often seem rather beset, but rather at the incremental and cumulative processes of science, the sheer mass of work that is being done and that needs to be done, and at the people who, through different disciplines, different approaches, are trying to look into the future for us, to tell us some things we might need to know about how to get there, or what to do when we do. I'd like to read a condensed version of the essay for you now. You can read the full story online. This is from The Forest at the Edge of Time. Let's begin somewhere around four and a half thousand years BCE in a patch of soil on the southwest coast of Western Australia. An ovule and some pollen combine on the crest of a ridge overlooking the sea. A plant begins to grow. It's a little thing, its juvenile leaves will become a faintly glossy bluish grey green as it matures. It's a eucalypt, a mallee, and it flowers with small white blossoms. The fruits are cup shaped, 
perfectly lovely hemispheres. More than 6,000 years later, in 1981, a government researcher happens to walk this ridge, find this plant, and report it to the Western Australian Herbarium, which sends a collector to investigate the following year. A decade later, it's formally scooped into science and classified in the Linnaean tradition, genera species, general specific, Eucalyptus phylacus. The botanists note that the tree is only known from the landscape where its original or type specimen was collected and that that population has already been damaged by roadworks. Its name derives, they say, from the Greek phylacus, a watcher or guard, female, referring to its occurrence on a hill overlooking the ocean. Thanks to its location, the tree becomes known as the Milup Mali. By the turn of the millennium, scientists know of more than 240 different species of eucalypts in the southwest region of Western Australia, 35 of which are considered rare and endangered, and 13 of which are known to grow in only one spot. The Milup Mali is one of these. The first work done on it in terms of conservation genetics confirms it as distinct from the species it most closely resembles, Eucalyptus decipiens, and reveals that all the stems of this tree, 173 in total, comprise exactly the same genetic material. Perhaps it's a hybrid, suggest researchers, but although E. decipiens is found growing in the vicinity and proposed as one putative parent, there is nothing apparent that could have provided the other side of the genetic equation. The tree is also found to be a single genet, as genetically distinct individuals are termed. It's perpetuating itself by cloning. Furthermore, that genet is of potentially great age. An estimate of the spread of the lignotuber and the diameter of the stems arranged above corresponds to the remarkable age of 6,380 years, a figure later revised upwards to 6,600. Posters and stickers are printed instructing visitors to take care of this precious thing. Declared rare flora markers are installed at one of its stands, while its specific location is alighted to assist its protection. The infringing car park is removed and rehabilitation of the site begins. Experiments successfully use the tree's tissue to clone new individuals. A 16-step interim recovery plan is drafted and the shire in which the eucalypt resides is formally notified of the presence and threatened nature of this organism. Rachel Sussman, an American artist seeking to photograph the oldest living things, flies to Perth to meet one of the conservation biologists working on the tree. I was handed a branch snapped off a propagated sapling in a research garden, she writes later, and instructed to match the leaf shape with that of the clonal eucalyptus I was in search of. She drives south for several hours and bushwhacks through thorny underbrush to find the leaf shape and structure just where I was told to look for it. And then, as the new millennium's first decade ends, Fire sweeps through the landscape where this tenacious tree grows. Two passing eucalypt specialists, Dean Nicole and Malcolm French, discovered that there are indeed nearby trees that could have provided that other long ago hybrid parent. In 2010, they write, following an earlier wildfire which burnt the E. phylacus genet and allowed easier access through and visibility within surrounding vegetation, a population of Eucalyptus virginia, consisting of about 10 clumps of plants, was discovered approximately 250 metres south. So the Milup Mali is not now a unique species, but a first-generation hybrid, most likely E. decipiens pollen crossed with an E. virginia ovule. E. phylacus is currently listed as threatened flora in Western Australia, write Nicole in French. We recommend that it be delisted due to its probable hybrid status. This 6,600-year-old tree remains unique, but is now seen through a new prism of information. This mallee stands, the tree remains. Here's one of the most captivating and seductive things about the nature of scientific inquiry. It's cumulative, incremental. Information grows as new technologies come online, new questions can be posed, new discoveries come to light. What we know continues to expand as each new researcher devotes attention imagination to something and frames a new hypothesis, and as each external variable leans in and exerts its own pressure. But however we name or define this organism, by whatever new scientific methods we seek to interrogate or understand it, in whatever changing context we need to understand what it does or may do next, 
and whatever quantities of information and knowledge we amass. Through all this, the eucalypt itself persists, in this case, through thousands of years. The tree stands on the ridge overlooking the ocean, the watcher on the hill. On the other side of the continent, the western edge of the Cumberland Plain touches the darkly inked lip of the Blue Mountains scarp. With the noise and heft of Sydney more than 60 kilometres southeast, here is a special sort of forest, a luscious mix including the forest red gum, a narrow-leafed ironbark and the grey box. According to recent botanical thinking, it looks today much as it looked 227 years ago, just prior to the arrival of European settlers. A tree canopy with an open grassy understory with some localised shrubby areas. While much of the plain has been cleared, farmed, settled and otherwise disappeared, this pocket is relatively intact. But it's not this nor its flora that make it unusual. Stand here a moment. See where that magpie is perched? See the minor bird balanced on that wire? See how the grey day sunlight turns those eucalypts trunks to silver? Something else glints silver here. Lines of thick rectangular piping etch a series of precise pathways to six pockets of this forested space, each delineated by a kind of cage that resembles the skeleton of a tank. It struts the same sandy beige as the nearby forest red gum trunks. Higher again, one for each tank, the spire of a fine green crane looms above the trees, while the ground below is busy with scientific detritus, sensors, baskets, buckets, monitors, and bright tape. The breeze in the tree's leaves makes a sound like the ocean. Beneath that, there's another whirring hum, the blowers feeding three of these six arrays with elevated levels of carbon dioxide, the equivalent of 550 parts per million. That's almost 150 parts per million above the levels of CO2 in the atmosphere today, and the equivalent of the levels the Earth is expected to reach in 20 to 30 years' time if we continue along the casual-sounding, business-as-usual path delineated by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And now, take a big breath. Standing here, you are breathing the air of the future, as are, of course, these eucalypts. This air tastes no different, smells no different, exudes no different sensation at all. But it is the air we will all be inhaling in my lifetime in a different sort of world the air with twice the concentration of CO2 than before industrialisation, the air that is well beyond the planet's designated safe operating limit of 350 parts per million, the air with the upper limit of that one greenhouse gas that, once achieved, sees the onset of what scientists predict will be the more serious effects of global warming. Earlier this century, we thought we would reach this level around 2050. Now we're on track to arrive earlier, perhaps as soon as the mid-2030s. This unique steampunk assemblage of old trees, some date back more than a century, and cutting-edge technologies is Ukeface, part of the impressive facilities housed by Western Sydney University's Hawkesbury Institute for the Environment. It is now the world's only free air CO2 enrichment, or FACE, experiment, currently running in native forest despite the usefulness of these experiments in terms of addressing ongoing uncertainties around ecosystems' responses to rising carbon dioxide levels and helping to fundamentally improve predictive understanding of the Earth system. The FACE facilities are like time machines that allow scientists to collect and collate actual data from an iteration of the future and from an established and whole forest ecosystem rather than from young trees planted specifically for study. In any part of the globe, in any biogeographical region, flora, particularly forests, are fundamental to discussions about climate change. As one study puts it, because forests dominate the terrestrial carbon cycle and climate projections are sensitive to carbon cycle feedbacks, the response of forest trees to warming is particularly important. Plants take up and store carbon dioxide via photosynthesis and return it via respiration. If trees are cut down or burnt, large amounts of CO2 are released into the air, like a great big exhalation. On the one hand, the planet's forests, if they are cleared, degraded or overused, currently account for about one-sixth of all global carbon emissions. On the other, carbon sequestration by intact and functional forests could also see absorption of about one-tenth of global emissions. 
About 16% of Australia is covered by forest, comprising 123 million hectares of native forest and about 2 million hectares of plantations. To talk about forests in Australia is to talk about that vast and dominant trio of genera, eucalyptus, corymbia, angophora, the eucalypts. Three quarters of our native forest trees are eucalypts, as are roughly half of our plantations. Wherever they grow, in gardens, in parks, in plantations, in that grab bag space, the bush, they are quintessentially Australian, diverse, iconic, familiar, and ubiquitous. On the Cumberland Plain, they comprise three of the four prominent tree species. Ukeface currently hosts about 90 different experiments from researchers from Australia and collaborators from seven other countries, and its six 25 metre diameter rings, each of which had to be constructed with no disturbance to this remnant forest, are the engineering epitome of treading lightly. Three rings carry today's air into their cages to generate comparable baseline data, while the other three run that futuristic air. The extra CO2 is an industrial byproduct, captured north of Sydney and driven here to be stored, vaporised and released. Because of its provenance, it carries a different isotope to the local air, making it trackable. And because it is stuff that would ordinarily be released at its original site, its release in this old growth forest adds no extra carbon to the world's equations. It simply relocates it. When that carbon dioxide was first turned on back in 2012, there was an almost immediate increase in the soil CO2 respiration level. We gave extra carbon to the trees, and what did they do? They spat it back out. Mark Jolka, one of the WSU researchers, laughs. Why is that happening? Are the roots getting it and growing more fine roots, and that's why there's more respiration? Are the roots exuding carbon compounds into the soil that are being used, or are they sloughing it off? And that's being used by the microbial community, the fungi and the bacteria that use plant-based carbon as a substrate for their processes. There's a whole host of interesting questions. The uke face will run, he says, for three, four, five more years. The idea was for 10 years, that's our ultimate goal, but whether we'll get there, we don't know. Longer time frames are integral to some of the more intriguing questions that might be asked. There are lots of different mechanisms and cycles that can be examined in isolation on shorter timescales, says Jolka, but then there are these feedback processes that take a longer time to manifest themselves and feedbacks are what make ecosystems. The reasons we see patterns in vegetation and structures in ecosystems is due to trade-offs and feedback mechanisms that help shape whole communities, and it takes a while to trace the carry-on effects. In a way, plants breathe a counterbalance for us. We take in oxygen and expel CO2. They take in CO2 and expel oxygen via photosynthesis. Through photosynthesis and respiration, they enable the transfer of moisture CO2 and oxygen to and from the atmosphere. To stand in a large forest on a quiet day, among, say, the giant eucalyptus regnans of the Styx Valley west of Hobart, is to almost hear the in and the out and to feel yourself breathing in time. This imagery of ebb and flow also fits the mechanics of evolution, the perennial adaptation of the eucalypts themselves, ranges contracting, ranges expanding, a very slow pulse of coming and going. But the other analogy that is often invoked is that of the forest as a sponge, soaking up some of our extraneous carbon dioxide. It is the idea of the trees as the planet's lungs. Understanding forests' capacity to take up CO2 is really important, says Jolka. Right now, they do take up quite a bit of our anthropogenic emissions. One concern is that there could be limits to that, a saturating response. And if that happens, that means an immediate acceleration of increased CO2 in the atmosphere without us having done anything. We're pretty good at predicting our emissions from fossil fuels, combustion, land use change and the like, he says. And right now, forests are putting the brakes on that. If that green sponge were to be saturated, we don't have a lot of other places to go. That's probably a really important prediction for policymakers to know about. Across all three genera, eucalyptus, corymbia, and angophora, eucalypts total in excess of 800 species and define, to a large extent, what Australia looks like. Divide Australia into squares measuring one degree latitude by one degree longitude, 
and you would have 808 squares with eucalypts present in all but 35. They range from the mallees, which may be less than a metre tall, to the towering giants of the mountain ash that grow in Tasmania and Victoria. They come with rough bark, smooth bark, shedding bark in an extraordinary palette of colours from deep mauves and rich oranges to palest blondes and silvers, leaves bright or dull, variously shaped, seeds that provide a design primer ranging from saucer and boat shaped to cuboid, pyramidal, D-shaped, linear and more. They're amazing species, says Mark Jolker, and they inhabit a range of habitats from the desert to snowy mountains. That's an amazing range of biological adaptation. Which makes a small parcel of land, 32 and a half hectares, just inland from the mouth of the Murray, an even more remarkable spot. Because at Currency Creek Arboretum, Dean Nicole, unraveller of the pedigree of the Mealup Mallee, has been growing as many species of Australia's iconic trees as possible since 1993, when average CO2 levels were just over 357 parts per million, already above that safe operating limit. Of course, Currency Creek presents just one set of climatic conditions. It can't be desert and Alps, coastal and highland all at once. Yet here are rows of unlikely bedfellows, like a yellow blossomed gum from a granite island off Western Australia's coast with a snow gum from Mount Kosciuszko. Here is a veritable menagerie of trees, a Carimbia from Kakadu, a mountain blue gum from Sydney's Hawkesbury River, a coastal mallee from Kangaroo Island, a varnished gum from Tasmania's Hearts Mountains. Nicole's most recent census lists more than 8,000 individual plants. I visited Dean Nicole back in 2002 when I was about to publish gum. His trees were mostly less than a decade old then, planted in groups of four per species, first one, then another, to create a mosaic of different shapes, different greens, with the bright punctuation of scarlet buds here, soft white ones there. If I had finished gum with a line about eucalypts being adaptable, diverse, tenacious, interactive, opportunistic, much like the people whose stories they defined, then seeing them in these rows, all getting along together, side by side, in a habitat quite unlike their original landscapes in many cases, only underscored my sense of their resilience and adaptability. Through the subsequent decade, as it became clear that any number of species were on the list of things we should worry about in terms of changing climatic conditions, not least our own, I held Nicole's rose at the back of my mind and worried less about the eucalypts. And then I read a Climate Institute briefing on the most recent report by the IPCC, released in September 2013, when CO2 levels were at 393.31 parts per million. It projected what might happen to various organisms if the world should achieve an increase in temperature of more than 3 degrees C. The report itself forecast increases of between 1.4 and 6.4 degrees by the end of this century. Wheat and grapes and sheep and eucalypts. The word shot from the page like a flare. What might happen to hardy, opportunistic and tenacious? And how did Dean Nicole's trees speak to this? It's important here to acknowledge the idea of husbandry, of tending, of nurturing. If you plant a eucalypt, any tree, anywhere, and nurture it, there's a good chance it will thrive. But here's another truth about all those eucalypts. In the natural landscape, without anyone to tend or nurture them, running the gamut of temperature and rainfall and all the other climatic variables, not to mention any unexpected pests or blights these combinations of conditions might bring on, Many of them have a surprisingly small range, and we've known that for almost 20 years. In the mid-1990s, Leslie Hughes, now Pro Vice-Chancellor for Research at Macquarie University, and better known perhaps for her ongoing work with the publicly funded Climate Council, made the first analysis of climatic range size for what she calls a big Australian group, the eucalypts. Hughes had just finished a PhD and was casting around for something different, she ended up among the gums thanks to her supervisor who suggested, you know, climate change might be an issue. She had access to the largest digitised data set of species information, which, in the 1990s, was the Australian National Herbarium's gumnut database of eucalypt collections. In addition, she had access to the world's first climate interpolation model for species distribution, BioClim, 
developed by CSIRO in the 1980s. Her supervisor suggested that they drive to Canberra, pick up Gumnut's floppy disk from the herbarium, drive it across town to the modeler at CSIRO, who would run the records through the models, and then drive home to Sydney that same day. It didn't quite happen like that. Hughes spent six months working with the Gumnut data to clean up the database, checking for duplicates, correcting transcription errors, and checking the identification for some species whose taxonomy was uncertain or contested, sometimes by consulting botanists who could look at a record and say, yes, I know that tree, that's out the back of the pub, because they'd collected it. I mapped every species on an overhead with a map of Australia on it, she says of the technology available. That was all we had. We posed the very simple question, how broad was the climatic range of each species? In other words, what ranges of temperature and rainfall did each species currently experience, she says. And the most obvious thing about the results was that the climatic ranges of many species were really narrow. Hughes showed for the first time the restricted living space of many of these trees, despite what a casual observer could mistake for ubiquity. She published her work in 1996, when carbon dioxide levels averaged 362.64 parts per million. As Hughes' first paper explained, unless current projections greatly overestimate future climate change in Australia, within the next few decades, many eucalypt species will have their entire present-day populations exposed to temperatures and rainfalls under which no individuals currently exist. Her second paper underscored this by explaining that 68% of eucalypt species had ranges that covered less than 1% of the continent, and only 3% of eucalypt species grew in ranges spanning more than 10% of Australia's available land. At its most fundamental, every conversation about climate change comes down to a question of adaptation, what a species will need to do in terms of surviving and thriving in a changing environment, and how, if at all, it will best be able to achieve those things. It's relatively easy to think about if the organism is an animal that might need to move further to find food or a more comfortable ambient temperature, but plants, and trees in particular, are a different case. In order for trees, or indeed any other type of plant, to move to other places, their seeds need to be dispersed, and they then need suitable conditions, water, light and soil characteristics, to enable them to establish and grow. In terms of our flora, says Hughes, in many terrestrial environments, trees are the most important structures that provide the habitat for other species. If the present day distribution of a particular eucalypt represents the full extent of where it is able to live, then many of our Australian icons could be in real trouble as the climate changes rapidly, she says. Icons is such an interesting word. We often imagine the world changing in terms of iconic animals, like pandas, like elephants, like rhinos. Imagine a landscape without its iconic trees. That kind of idea could take your breath away. If the eucalypts were to magically disappear overnight from the length and breadth of Australia, they would still have populations in other parts of the world. These trees were probably global travellers even before the first British boats arrived in Australian waters. While Joseph Banks collected specimens during Cook's first voyage, the name eucalyptus was coined for a specimen collected seven years later from Bruny Island during Cook's third and final expedition. Every subsequent visiting naturalist and collector scooped up branches of this, stems of that, shipping them to botanical experts on the other side of the world. But it wasn't only pressed and dried eucalypt specimens that were sent offshore. Seeds made their way too. And enthusiastic growers in the Northern Hemisphere, aristocrats, merchants, botanists and nurserymen, tried their hand with this distinct new genus. Exports of eucalypt seeds soared with the enthusiasm of Ferdinand von Müller, director of Melbourne's Royal Botanic Gardens from 1857 to 1873. A passionate advocate for these species, Müller evangelised in the name of eucalypts for decades. They were the prince of trees. They were the best of lumber. They were transformers of climate, stemming everything from fevers to malaria. They reminded him of the tree of life described in the apocalypse, whose leaves shall be for the healing of the nations. 
In 1861 alone, he dispatched 51,290 packets of seeds from Melbourne. I was thinking about Mueller's dispersed trees, encouraged beyond their natural ranges, as I walked up to see Leslie Hughes and paused at a courtyard of lemon-scented spotted gums, Corymbia citriodora. This tree's home range runs north from Coffs Harbour on the north coast of New South Wales and on past my place in Brisbane to the bottom of the Cape York Peninsula. Macquarie University, by contrast, sits just out from Sydney's CBD, not where these trees naturally grow. Here they were, successfully transplanted, more than 500 kilometres further south than the southern limit of their range, going along. Like Dean Nicole, Hughes had spoken of husbandry and of its more scientific version, experiments that would take species beyond their natural ranges, watch them grow, and measure what happened. There are certain types of questions you can only answer this way, she'd explained, but they're not often done because they're bloody hard, they're very labour intensive, they take a long time, and they're very expensive. These experiments transpose a species in space as effectively as Ukeface transposes them in time. They would be one sure way of understanding how trees would behave in new environments, under new conditions. And here's the best bit. The eucalypts have been undertaking their own version of these experiments for years, and now the results are coming in. One of the researchers employed by CSIRO back in the 1970s to improve methods of predicting where and how well particular trees will grow was Trevor Booth, an English ecologist. Booth had studied at a university conveniently located near an aircraft factory, and the university had installed a very large computer to assist aeronautical studies. I got interested in using computers in ecology, he says. That simple sentence has led him through decades of work unravelling how well different eucalypts will grow both in Australia and overseas and, as one of his research papers puts it, which biodiverse plantings are suitable for changing climatic conditions. As well as Bioclim and his own programs, Booth uses the Atlas of Living Australia to generate this knowledge making it accessible to anyone from school kids to species experts. This allows users to see not only what is already growing in their own landscape, but other places where those same species are growing, and whether these match projections for climate change in their own local landscape. What the eucalypts have in addition to this, and ahead of almost any other genus, is the combined knowledge of those millions of seeds sent around the world by enthusiastic botanists and foresters. Hundreds of eucalypt species have already been trialled and grown outside Australia, often in conditions that are completely different to their home ranges, which means we already have all this interesting information, these insights, about how they've performed under different conditions. And it's this information that Booth is voraciously gathering from trials and commercial plantings, both in Australia and around the world. Here's an example of how eucalypts overseas are telling us interesting things, he says. There's Eucalyptus nitens, the shining gum, grown as a plantation species in South Africa, and it doesn't flower there at most plantations because it's growing under slightly warmer conditions. If it doesn't flower, it won't produce seed, and if it doesn't produce seed, it can't reproduce. Now that may be one of the things to look out for as conditions change, he says. If things are getting stressed, if they're not flowering, you can see that from the capsules on the ground. In the broadest terms, says Booth, eucalypts are possibly in a fortunate position. They set the stage on which things happen, he says, meaning that they impact more on other smaller organisms than those smaller organisms usually impact on them. And what could be considered limitations in some ways ecologically, he says, make eucalypts particularly interesting for climate change studies. There's the fact that they're long-lived. Okay, if you're looking at fruit flies, you can show they're adapting because you can breed them much more quickly. But eucalypts could live for a couple of hundred years, he says, and they're not going to change dramatically or move. Eucalypts get three chances to move through their landscape, via their fruit capsules, if they are transported in some way, via the seeds encased in those capsules when they fall and split, or via their pollen, which is often moved by beetles, such as cetonids and jewel beetles, birds and bees. Some have mechanisms that prevent seedlings from growing too close to established plants. River red gums drop an inhibitor in their reject leaves and bark that prevents their seeds germinating under them where they would have little chance of surviving. 
If a tree's pollen contains its nuclear or paternal genome, a tree's seed contains its mitochondrial or maternal genome. Pollen moves a lot further than the seed, so the nuclear genomes move around more than the maternal genomes, says Robert Henry, director of the Queensland Alliance for Agriculture and Food Innovation. We've done work on the paternity of stands that looks at the relationship of a tree to all the trees going away from it, he says. There are trees 400 or 500 metres away at low frequency that are related, but relatives tend to be the trees that are pretty close. What his group has also discovered is that eucalypts like to share. They're highly promiscuous, is how he describes it. We see all these different species, but there seems to be an incredible gene flow between them, which means, he suspects, that the species can all evolve together. If there's a nuclear gene that's really advantageous, it will spread across the whole system. He smiles. Being able to share the best things, that's nice. That's the advantage of some sort of swarm. But as a biological concept, it certainly challenges the species concept, he says. You've got to think, what is a species? At the end of July, then, came National Tree Planting Day, a community event celebrating its 20th anniversary this year and aiming to achieve more than 22 million trees and plants in the ground in that time. This year, for the first time, you could register to plant at home. On the last Sunday of July, people at more than 3,000 locations in Australia planted trees. My boy and I were among them in our front yard with five acacias, five eucalypts and a self-struck avocado to contribute. We prepared our holes, we shook our tiny trees free from the embrace of their dirt and looked at their roots, those delicate, intricate fibres. We bedded them in and watered them, one of us being relatively careful the other more cavalier as he attempted to make rainbows with the hose. And we stood for a while in our garden. We talked about why it's good to plant trees, why it's especially good to plant trees these days. It's an interesting thing, aiming for the right balance, the right words, when you're talking climate change with a six-year-old. We talked about the way trees breathe, and my boy leaned into our tiny new mallies to blow his breath gently across their leaves just giving them a bit more air, he explained. How many trees would we need to breathe for the world? When I had asked Mark Jolker that kind of impossible question, he had told me that while tree planting is good for a number of reasons, it engages people and trees, particularly in environments that include humans and communities, are just great. We couldn't make the maths work. The numbers tell us that we cannot plant enough trees to take care of our problem, he said, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't plant trees. A recent study has shown that having 10 or more trees in a city block, on average, improves health perception in ways comparable to an increase in annual personal income of $10,000 or being seven years younger. We've had so many prisms through which to look at our trees, our eucalypts, and any organism on the face of the earth. Even as distinct and unique a thing as a 6,600-year-old clonal mallee can prove to be malleable, when considered through different lenses. And there's a marvellous confluence between the technologies we have now, models, sensors, sequences, all the ways we have of asking questions, and the scale of a matter like climate change. We can answer specific questions about how photosynthesis changes when temperatures rise or leaf respiration is altered by drought. We can investigate eucalypt's carbon safety mechanisms and their carbon assimilation rate. We can understand the impacts of phosphorus and endogenous rhythms on the way forest red gums breathe overnight. We can learn that rhinoceros beetles can reverse the effects of elevated CO2 on blue gum saplings' roots, and the way environmental stress affects sap flow. What we know about eucalypts and climate change now runs to scores of published papers and continues to grow. Some models of some of their ranges projected for 10, 40, 70 years hence, suggests that many species in the eastern and southern seaboards will be pushed toward the continental limit, while large tracts of currently treed landscapes, especially in the continental interior, will change dramatically in terms of species composition and ecosystem structure. Some are more optimistic about their plasticity. There's no doubt that the politics of climate change can feel beset and exhausting, or that the coalface work of climate science can cause some of the most pragmatic of investigators to despair. 
But in November, the world goes to Paris for the United Nations Climate Change Conference with the widely accepted goal that temperature rises must be capped at two degrees above pre-industrial levels to avoid the most dangerous impacts. It's a big ask to achieve a legally binding agreement from the world's countries. But we have an ever-growing mountain of information available to help us to adapt and to lay out the likely consequences of inaction. Around the world, different researchers, different laboratories are assembling information about the complexity of our vast systems, the eucalypts among them, piece by piece by piece. In some ways, says Trevor Booth, we're embarking on the experiment no one would allow us to do in terms of the globe. If I put in a proposal saying, you know, I'd like to increase the temperature by two or three degrees in this particular location and arc up CO2 levels, just imagine how difficult it would be to get approval. He takes a breath. It's a beautiful but concerning problem, and we're very fortunate that the eucalypts fit into this so interestingly because they have been moved around so much. Mark Jolker sees them as a model system from an evolutionary standpoint and as fascinating models of adaptation within species. Along the east coast of Australia, there are widely distributed eucalypts, he says, and narrowly distributed eucalypts. That's been a question in ecology for a long time. Why is that? Have they always been rare? Are they a relict population from a bygone era when maybe they were more widespread? One of our studies found marked differences in species in populations from cooler climates. They showed an intrinsic capacity to respond more positively to warming than populations of the same species from Queensland, where they were perhaps growing at the edge of their thermal tolerance. Jolka pauses. These are really important questions. If we truly wanted to experiment with how all those pieces fit together, single species, feedback mechanisms, and us, and all we do, how they might change and what they might become, we would need three planets to make the experiment rigorous. And here we are with one. We stand on the hill, my boy and I, and we watch our new trees sniffing at the delicate lemon scent of one of our new gums and basking in the sun. In our world, that warm winter's morning, the latest carbon dioxide level is tracking at just over 401 parts per million and rising, still rising, rising still. The essay appeared in the October 2015 issue of Australian Book Review. To purchase a copy of the print edition, go to our website www.australianbookreview.com.au it also appears in our digital edition, which is called ABR Online, and you can subscribe to ABR Online very inexpensively via our website.